America was in shock. As we sifted through the rubble in the weeks that followed 9-11, the country was terrified that another attack could occur at any moment from any quarter. The Bush administration quickly began to push through sweeping policy changes. Before anyone had a chance to understand what went wrong, he proposed fixes that went far beyond fighting terrorism. This is what happens when federal legislators respond in panic. Congress had been evacuated because of the anthrax scare, and most of us were hanging around the lawn of the Capitol. We're really out of touch. Yet uh, they felt some desire to rush this bill through. Give us a weekend to read it, and let's take it up Monday morning. Hey, I'll come in and vote at 7 o'clock on Monday morning if it's that urgent. In the Senate, they called it the United in Strengthening America Act. And in the House, they called it the Patriot Act, providing appropriate tools uh, required to intercept and obstruct terrorist acts. And the compromise was to call it both, the USA Patriot Act. But the real purpose behind those names, of course, was to suggest that anyone who would criticize it is unpatriotic, is a traitor. To those who scare peace-loving people with phantoms of lost liberty, my message is this. Your tactics only aid terrorists. When the Patriot Act was first sent to the Congress by the Bush administration, it came with a request that we hold no hearings on it so that there would be no public input or public discourse. That might have even been somewhat acceptable uh, had it been the bill that was uh, considered by and adopted unanimously by the committee, but it wasn't. For six weeks previously, Congress had debated how to address law enforcement needs in the wake of 9-11 and eventually a bill was crafted that had bipartisan support. To have Bob Barr on the far right, Barney Frank, far left, agree was an amazing uh, feat. We came up with a, a draft of the bill that, uh, that did have very, very broad support across the Judiciary Committee. Unfortunately, it was then changed uh, in a last-minute draft before it came up on the floor. Sometime very late in the evening after midnight, uh, the John Ashcroft version, Bush White House version uh, was substituted. The bill was printed at 3.45 a.m. the morning before the vote on the House floor. And you tell me how many of the 435 members of Congress had a chance between 3.45 a.m. and 11 a.m. to read a bill that was 345 pages long. No member of Congress read this legislation before it was voted on, not a one. This is still warm. It just came off the Xerox machine. This isn't the bill that was adopted by a unanimous 36 vote uh, major of Democrats and Republicans of the Judiciary Committee. These are critical issues. This is what we're fighting for. These are our civil liberties. The we new bill contained provisions that had been rejected by Congress before 9-11 had even occurred. Where they need to be strengthened and give them more effect. When I looked at the draft, I said, I've seen this before. Almost all of the provisions represented uh, efforts to expand federal law enforcement power. They used the cover of fighting terrorism to really greatly expand federal law enforcement powers. The Patriot Act ultimately passed both the House and the Senate with overwhelming support. This legislation is essential not only to pursuing and punishing terrorists, but also preventing more atrocities in the hands of the evil ones. President Bush quickly signed the Patriot Act into law. It was only the beginning. Some of the worst violations of civil liberties have happened without the input or without the authorization of Congress or the American public. In fact, it's often happened with the discussion and with the approval of a small number of men within the executive branch. These few men have changed the character of America, but have they made us any safer? We were starting to get calls very quickly after September 11th from people that would tell us um, my cousin was arrested, my brother was arrested, and my uncle. And when we started inquiring about where they were taken or who took them, most of the families that we were talking to 
didn't really know. Right after 9-11, the government began arresting immigrants from Arab and Muslim countries in an unprecedented way. We were targeting communities on the basis of stereotypes. Hey, I saw someone with a beard. This one came out, he prays by kneeling his uh, down and putting his forehead on the ground. Must be a terrorist. That's the level of ignorance that we have in this country. People were essentially presumed guilty until determined to be innocent. The government called these people detainees as if they were simply being made late for dinner. But the reality was much uglier. These folks were kept in solitary confinement, which is, you know, 23 to 24 hours a day of lockup. Um, no contact with the outside world, uh, sometimes without any blankets in the middle of winter. The lights were on 24 hours. The windows were covered over. People didn't know what hour of the day or night it was. These were terrible conditions. And many people were beaten during this time. They were shackled hands to waist to feet. They were strip searched every time they had to leave the cell. Many of them were yanked along the floor. The arrests were considered secret, and the detainees were allowed little contact with the outside world. They were held for months, even though they had broken no criminal laws. The Justice Department called it the hold until clear policy. The hold until clear policy was not the subject of any public debate or even debate within Congress. That was a change implemented by the Justice Department itself. It was done on the stroke of one politician's pen and it affected the lives of hundreds of immigrants all across the country. This was undertaken wholly outside of the Patriot Act. It was simply a decision by John Ashcroft, a very public decision. Even within the Justice Department itself, there was enormous debate and controversy about whether or not the policy was constitutional, legal, or correct. This rule change will apply to the 75 individuals who are currently detained. In the same way that McDonald's tells you how many hamburgers they've sold, the government was giving us kind of a running tally. There have been a total of over 480 people arrested or have arrested or detained. 614 persons. Detained nearly 1,000 individuals. He swept broadly, he swept September blindly, until the number was over 1,000, and people started asking questions. They said, how many of these 1,000 people have been charged with the crimes of September 11th? And the answer was zero. Then the people asked, well, how many of these people, these suspected terrorists, have been charged with any crime related to terrorism? And the answer was zero. So th those were not good answers for the, from the government's perspective. So what did the government do? In early November, it announced, we no longer will give out a uh, daily tally. It's too difficult for us to give out a daily tally. It wasn't difficult for them when they thought it sent the message that we're doing something to fight terrorism, but when it started to send the message, we're locking up lots of people who don't have any, aren't even charged with terrorism, they just stopped telling us how many people were detained. The net result of our profligate use of detentions without legal representation has been to make us less safe. That's uncovered any terrorist. The Constitution is really quite clear. In parts of the Constitution, the rights and privileges are reserved only for American citizens, like the right to vote. But elsewhere in the Constitution, the Founding Fathers were equally explicit. No person shall be denied life, liberty, or property without due process of law. They did not say no citizen. They said no person. Extension 14. Message received. Oh, thank you. I uh, have a consultation to make about a case that we're handling, and we were wondering if we are required to turn over information about the immigration status of our victims. Um, it is a um, very specific case where we might be asked for uh, doing that, and we would like to educate ourselves, get as much information as possible. Please call me back. My number is... Can you believe it? I have a police department calling asking if they need to turn over the immigration status of crime victims. Crime victims, the victims of crime. That's what's happening since Attorney General Ashcroft has given people the idea that state and local police are supposed to be involved in enforcing immigration laws. The victims of crime are not protected any longer. Ashcroft's directive that local police enforce immigration law also means that if an immigrant witnesses a crime, they will now be afraid to come forward fearing that they may be deported or even locked up indefinitely. That leaves criminals to run free on the streets, 
which is exactly why police departments in Los Angeles and Seattle have policies not to enforce immigration law. What you're doing is making local policemen surrogates for this, for this uh, enforcement, and they're not versed in immigration law. They don't understand immigration law. They don't know what the law is. Or how can you ask them to go enforce it? It's uh, terribly destructive of, uh, of local law enforcement time and resources. The only way to find the real terrorists is through the hard job of investigative law enforcement, investigating individual uh, suspicious behavior that pertains to a person who's doing something wrong as opposed to attacking an entire segment of the population. To focus on whole groups of individuals, whole classes of individuals who've done nothing more than be born in the wrong country or worship the wrong God is poor law enforcement that makes us less safe. But the Justice Department has ignored the recommendations of counterterrorism experts. Instead, they initiated a sweep of immigrants who worked at the nation's airports with the idea that such mass arrests would prevent another hijacking. And many of the people who rounded up, the majority, were Latinos. Um, they had nothing to do with terrorism. No terrorists were caught. Somehow the government felt like the country would feel better if we rounded up people serving pizza and cleaning in the airports. And mass deportations were secretly begun. What the federal government did is it commissioned private commercial airliner jets from different airlines, and it had these nighttime airlift deportations. 60, 70, 100, 80 Pakistani individuals in an airplane that might be a Portuguese airline jet that would take off in the middle of the night and return people to Pakistan. Nobody here would be notified. People would have vanished. Their families wouldn't have been able to trace them. We rounded up people that were seeking political asylum in this country. We sent them back to the place they were running from. Reports began to filter back that people had been tortured in Syria, disappeared in Egypt, and murdered in Pakistan. We put all these people in terrible situations all around the world. And it's, you know, the enormity of that, every once in a while, overwhelms me. You know, it's like, th this, this can't be the country that I grew up in. The way America had treated the detainees was so bad that the Justice Department's Inspector General found it necessary to issue a report condemning what had occurred. A report came out by the Office of the Inspector General of the Department of Justice that basically confirmed that all of these things did happen. This was not a report of outside critics. This was a report done by the Inspector General of the Justice Department itself, criticizing the haphazard and the indiscriminate manner in which the rights of immigrants were trampled upon in the aftermath of 9-11. Within a day or two afterwards, Attorney General John Ashcroft got on the news and said, well, we do it the same way all over again. He insisted that he had done nothing wrong, that he had no regrets, that he would do it all over again. This is the chief law enforcement officer of the United States that's saying, well, yes, we'd, we'd you know, redo all of these unconstitutional policies all over again. And, and we're just floored because there's another department in our government that is basically saying this is horrendous and it can't happen. And here is our attorney general saying, I don't care. What's happening in Guantanamo is symptomatic of the way the government is proceeding in its war against terrorism, which basically seems to be anything goes. Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, a strange place for the U.S. to have a military base. Set up after the Spanish-American War in 1903, the U.S. has paid about $4,000 in rent to the Cuban government annually. Until recently, it was a little-known outpost. But after 9-11, the U.S. government adopted a policy that would shock the rest of the world. Guantanamo Bay was chosen as the place where the administration wanted to hold people that they picked up in the war on terrorism, no matter where they picked them up, from Afghanistan or Pakistan or Bosnia or anywhere else. And they really went around and they looked, where can we hold people and not be subject to court review or any legal restrictions? In Guantanamo, the U.S. government insists that the men held are not entitled to the protections of the Geneva Convention since they're not prisoners of war, that they weren't combatants of a state power. And yet, by the same token, the government argues that they're not entitled to the protections of constitutional laws because they're not held on American territory. 
The administration chose Guantanamo as an island outside the sovereignty of the United States, but subject to our exclusive control. And they did that for the specific purpose of avoiding the law, avoiding all the rules, the Geneva Conventions, our Constitution. By creating this sort of label of terrorist, unlawful enemy combatant, they're trying to use a sort of propaganda on why we shouldn't care about them, why we shouldn't ensure due process for them, um, and kind of sacrifice our values as Americans that we've held so high. All of us thought, um, when we started hearing about Guantanamo, that the people that were going there were people that were fighting for the Taliban, that were part of Al-Qaeda. And there probably are a lot of people there that aren't very nice. But what we quickly learned from groups that were permitted to go in and to do civil rights and human rights assessments is that there were people there that really didn't belong there. Because the battlefield in Afghanistan was everywhere and anywhere. And so that meant that anyone who was in and around was subject to being brought in. Whether they were fighting for al-Qaeda or fighting for the Taliban, as the military suggests, or whether they were simply in the wrong place at the wrong time, picked up by a bounty hunter who wanted to claim a reward that the military was giving out for bringing in al-Qaeda people. There were men that were well into their 80s that were brought into this net, and there were children. This wasn't just people that were soldiers on the field. Mozam Beg is a British national whose family says he was installing wells in Afghanistan and teaching in Pakistan until shortly after 9-11. I received a telephone call from my son. He said, Dad, I've been arrested. And uh, I said, what? Why? He said, I don't know. I said, who has arrested you? He says, Americans, and I don't know where they're taking me. And the line was disconnected. For over a month after his arrest, his family had no idea of his whereabouts. Finally, they received a letter. He had been taken to Guantanamo Bay. Everything about these detentions is designed to render these human beings into the state of total dependence on the United States military. They're held in solitary. They're manacled when pulled out for interrogation. They're interrogated at great length. They can't reach out to anybody. They can't call a lawyer. They can't call their families. These people are entirely at the mercy of the military with no end in sight to their detention. And not surprisingly, there have been suicide attempts. At last count, more than 30 of the Guantanamo Bay detainees had tried to kill themselves. We don't hear about that anymore because the government no longer reports suicide attempts. Begg's family had no understanding of the graveness of his circumstances. The few letters they did get from him avoided details altogether. In fact, he was trying to avoid everything because I had bypass operation and I was not well enough. So he was not writing anything clear to me. After a year, I wrote to him that I'm very well. There is nothing wrong with me. Then, in response to that letter, he wrote me a letter saying that, I'm pleased that you're well. Pleased to know that you can do all the activities, but my position is different. I haven't seen moon, sun, or natural light for the last one year, except two minutes. I've been kept like, a, like an animal in a cage, they don't give me food. They don't give me water. My clothes are too. Where are my human rights? There is no one to help me. That's why I'm writing you. So please help me if you can. That letter actually tore me apart. <clears throat> I didn't know what to do. Straight away got in touch with foreign office. They said we don't have any access. Americans won't allow us to go there. So we do not know anything about him. If you're here, we'll let you know. 
They never ever did anything. What Begg's father is asking for his son is specifically guaranteed in tenets of international law. He wants an impartial trial. If he's guilty, he should be punished. If he's not guilty, why should he be there? The United States has refused to abide by the Geneva Conventions. There are the, the rules of war that were developed after World War II. Basically, what they say is when you capture people during a war, you have to treat them humanely. You have to give them medical assistance. You have to, first of all, decide who they are. You know, they get this right to this tribunal that decides, are you a prisoner of war? Are you a civilian? Do you have nothing to do with this whatsoever? In lieu of a trial, President Bush has declared that certain of the Guantanamo detainees, Mozambique among them, will be subjected to a military tribunal. There is no presumption of innocence in this process because to even go to a military commission, you have to be presumed to be a terrorist. And they're using that as justification to lower the standards of justice that we're used to in this country. President Bush has already let it be known how he feels about these people. Now, the only thing I know for certain is that these are bad people. And we look forward to working closely with the Blair government to deal with the issue. The White House counsel, Alberto Gonzalez, advised the president to ignore the Geneva Conventions at Guantanamo. He said the Geneva Conventions are obsolete and quaint and shouldn't govern the way that we need to question prisoners there. Secondly, he said, it's a good thing from our standpoint if you say the Geneva Conventions don't apply, because under US law, violations of the Geneva Conventions can be prosecuted as war crimes. So we could be prosecuted for war crimes for not following them. But if we say they don't apply, then we have an excuse to say that we can't be prosecuted. We have heard recently that there are allegations of what we've seen at Abu Ghraib really occurred at Guantanamo as well. And we know that General Miller, who was in charge of Guantanamo and now is in charge of Iraq, said that he could violate the Geneva Conventions at Guantanamo. One of the real concerns when we treat others like this in the name of fighting a war um, is that others fighting us can treat our soldiers like this. We're setting the standard under which we're going to say it's OK to do this to our service members. It's OK for uh, North Korea to capture a US citizen and, and label them an unlawful enemy combatant and try them in our same system where some Army general is making all the decisions, and he, he appoints a panel of just his army officers to, to be the judge and jury. When Donald Rumsfeld was asked, how long can these people be held? He said, as long as the war on terrorism lasts. Then they asked him, when will we know when the war on terrorism is over? He said, when there are no longer any terrorist organizations of potentially global reach left in the world. Now, all of us have potentially global reach today. And we're never going to eliminate political violence from the face of the earth. So what he's essentially saying is that we can hold these people forever without ever charging them with anything, without ever giving them a hearing of any kind. Congress shall have the power to declare war and make rules concerning captures on land and water. Article 1 of the US Constitution. Locked up indefinitely? No lawyer, no trial. If you think this can't happen to an American citizen, think again. We have disrupted an unfolding terrorist plot to attack the United States by, de by exploding a radioactive dirty bomb. I get a phone call in the car. The prosecutor calls up. He says, your, your client was taken by the military. And I thought they were joking. Um, thank you, but no comment at this time. Newman's client, Jose Padilla, had been held as a material witness for an entire month before Ashcroft's dramatic announcement. He had been charged with no crime, but was seen as someone who could provide information to a grand jury about 9-11. Suddenly, he was being called a terrorist. We know that Abdullah al here is an al-Qaeda operative. Broadcasting live from Moscow, Ashcroft announced the arrest as if Padilla had just been caught and a terrorist act narrowly averted. Be clear. We know from multiple independent and corroborating sources. Nothing had happened from the time of his arrest four weeks before till his designation. And the information that they had was the same. 
So one has to think, okay, so then what changed? And I wanted to point out to uh, Director Mueller that that seemed Just prior to Ashcroft's announcement, FBI whistleblower Colleen Rowley had been appearing before Congress. She was testifying about the lack of intelligence sharing between the FBI and CIA and how they'd bungled the warnings that might have prevented 9-11. We need to streamline the FBI's bureaucracy in order to more effectively combat terrorism. Uh, let me just start off by saying... Now that Rowley's issues seem passe, as the Justice Department kept emphasizing that interagency collaboration had led to Padilla's capture and the country saved from a terrorist attack. It was a result of the close cooperative uh, work of FBI agents and CIA agents. Close cooperation among U.S. government agencies. But what had all this cooperation yielded? Within hours, I mean, 24 hours, the government then had news conferences in which they backtracked. They said, well, it wasn't really a plot, you know, it was just like in the talking stages. I want to emphasize again, there was not an actual plan. There were discussions about um, this uh, possible plan, and it was in the discussion stage. It certainly wasn't at the point of having a specific target. What's remarkable is when you read the government's papers is that they insist that the government does not have to charge Mr. Padilla with a crime. They don't really have any evidence of any crime. They have a notion that he might have met with people from Al-Qaeda, but they don't think he's a member, and they've said so in court papers. So what was the sudden urgency? The cynical among us might believe it was to deflect Rowley's damaging information. The government wasn't saying. And with Padilla now locked up in solitary confinement in a naval brig in South Carolina, he wasn't able to explain anything either. Some information about Padilla began to surface, as a teenager in Chicago, Padilla's involvement in a murder committed by an older gang member landed him in juvenile detention. He later moved to Florida, and when he was 21, he went to prison for 10 months after firing a gun into the air during an argument. Upon his release, he converted to the Islamic faith at a center known for preaching nonviolence. Over the next 10 years, his only run-ins with the law were for minor traffic violations. His new religion would take him to the Middle East, where he married his second wife. On a return trip to the United States, he was taken into custody. Mr. Padilla was arrested at Chicago O'Hare Airport. He was initially detained under the material witness statute, and only after they could no longer hold him under that statute did they then label him as an enemy combatant. Padilla's activities and his association with al-Qaeda make him an enemy combatant. An enemy combatant? I didn't, what? Where did you make up that term? You know, I really had never heard of it. I thought the administration's rules on military tribunals said they would be only for non-American citizens. Is the, is the whole point of holding him uh, in, as a military combatant to be able to question him without using conventional criminal process? Uh, his status, as the Attorney General said in his statement, is as an enemy combatant. He is being detained under the laws of war as an enemy uh, combatant. And if the president labels them an enemy combatant, or in President Bush's words, a bad guy, they can be held indefinitely, incommunicado, without a hearing, without charges. Congress has already ruled on this. Congress said, you can't ever use our military for domestic law enforcement purposes. We don't want you doing that. We don't want you to use the military to arrest citizens. We don't want martial law. And this president and this attorney general says, I don't have to follow the rules. Does he have legal representation at the moment? Uh, the, uh, he was being held under uh, the authority of a federal judge, um, and he had legal rep representation uh, in connection with that. Yes. Does Larry, he now? How does far he did now? they get? I called the Department of Defense. I even called the White House. I got the response. He will not be able to call me. I will not be able to call him. I will not be able to visit him. And while, of course, I can write to him, they would not guarantee that he would receive my mail. Although the government now claims that Padilla may have been involved in a plot to blow up apartment buildings, they have provided no evidence nor charged him with a crime. The detention of an American citizen indefinitely without counsel is based not only on hearsay, could be triple hearsay for all we know, but they admit that one of the individuals who gave the information has lied to them in the past, has his own agenda for giving information, and the other, inf the other informant, in quotes, 
recanted. We've never in the history of the United States had investigative detention. We, we, don't, we don't do that, you know, except now we do. Recently, the Supreme Court decided that enemy combatants such as the Guantanamo prisoners and Jose Padilla have the right to an attorney and access to a court of law. It remains to be seen how the government will comply with this ruling. The accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial and be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. The Sixth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Every step of the way, we've heard John Ashcroft tell the public, trust us, we're the government. And yet he refuses to release important information that the public needs in order to understand what's at stake. Government claims of secrecy can rightfully be viewed with suspicion. And the secret, 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 as we have learned in history, generally, it's they're hiding their lack of evidence. Korematsu is a perfect example. Korematsu is when the, the Japanese were interned based on the government's allegation that these people were dangerous and had to be put in internment camps indefinitely until the war was over. Subsequently, after the war, everybody now knows that the information that the government gave to the court was false. They misled the court on purpose. And the rest of the information, of course, they said is secret, secret, secret. And the secret, secret, secret was, we don't have anything. In 1953, at the height of the Cold War, the government also misled the Supreme Court in the case of U.S. versus Reynolds. That ruling established the government's right to secrecy if it jeopardized national security. But the Los Angeles Times recently revealed that the government used the national security claim to hide the truth about the Air Force's poor maintenance of a B-29 bomber that crashed, killing nine people. The national security claim was a lie. There's a legacy of abuse of these very kinds of powers. We went through the civil rights movement where the FBI and the CIA were investigating uh, the civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, the anti-war protesters, people who were perceived to be the political enemies of the government. The same authority is now vested in the Justice Department by the Patriot Act, and that's a dangerous situation for Americans. I can't confirm or deny who our client is. I can't confirm or deny some of the arguments that we've made in our legal papers. I can't even talk about the basic facts about what has led the government to try to seal this lawsuit from public review and from public scrutiny. I can't talk about why the government insists that it jeopardizes national security. The ACLU has challenged some of the unconstitutional clauses present in the Patriot Act, but they have been gagged from even telling the American public what is going on. Even as the president has made the Patriot Act one of the cornerstones of his reelection campaign, we can't tell the public about the circumstances and facts of our lawsuit challenging a portion of the Patriot Act's constitutionality. I think that the world is going to be more peaceful and free as a result of this discussion. Our fellow citizens have a better understanding of the importance of the Patriot Act and why it needs to be renewed and expanded the importance of the Patriot Act when it comes to defending America, our liberties, and at the same time that it still protects our liberties under the Constitution. The public needs to have the facts as it makes its decisions about whether or not the Patriot Act went too far. The ACLU is not the only organization that has been silenced by the Patriot Act. If librarians have been approached by the FBI, they of course can't tell you that because one of the rules in the Patriot Act is that you can't tell, which is terrifying, really. What it allows the government to do is to come in and subpoena your customer records to find out what books have been checked out or what books they've bought. It doesn't allow the bookstore to contact a lawyer to fight it. It's, it's all done through Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court um, and doesn't, doesn't give us an opportunity to stand up for our customers. At least when you get a subpoena from a local court because there's reasonable cause to suspect that someone has broken the law and their library records would, in, would contribute to the investigation, that's what the law used to be. At least you could tell anybody that you had responded to the subpoena. And they don't even need reasonable suspicion to obtain records on you. Employment records, medical records, and even banking records. The government has deputized 
the banking industry to spy on American consumers. What we see is the possibility that banks in, their, in doing their policing duty for the government are going to be looking at who we are, finding out more information than they ought to. It's a very profitable place for them because they get to sell information about us. You just wonder, are you giving the wrong people too much authority? Government agents can now check on who you are sending email to, who you are getting email from, and what websites you visit by claiming it is relevant to an investigation. It requires no showing that the individual whose records are being sought actually engaged in or had any connection to any kind of terrorist conduct. So it basically makes all of us vulnerable. When you look at the Patriot Act, you're struck by the fact that many of its provisions are not limited to fighting terrorism. They affect federal criminal law and procedure generally. Most Americans believe that the Patriot Act was focused on the war on terror. And yet they're surprised to find that there are portions of the Patriot Act that have nothing to do with the war on terror. In fact, there's one section of the Patriot Act that allows the government to conduct delayed notice searches what we call sneak and peek searches. Sneak and peek warrants are when the FBI wants to search your property and even remove possessions, and the Justice Department can delay notifying you. So you can think for weeks, even months, that you've been victimized by a burglar when, really, the Justice Department has sent its agents into your home. It gives the government the power to get warrants for secret searches of homes and secret wiretaps of phones uh, uh, without sh any showing of probable cause that an individual has engaged in criminal activity, which is the usual constitutional minimum required. These Patriot Act powers are being used on ordinary petty crimes, on drug enforcement, on crimes that have had nothing to do with terrorism or the terrorist attacks of September 11. What much of the American public doesn't fully understand is that the USA Patriot Act creates permanent changes to our nation's laws. More than 90% of the Patriot Act will remain as permanent law unless and until we change it. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause. The Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. The police and the federal law enforcement authorities working in coordination are targeting political activists because of their speech, because of their thoughts, because of their opposition to this administration. If a place is a place to which the public is invited and in which the public is welcome, it is a place in which the FBI is, is welcome. I believe that the Justice Department has gone too far in changing the domestic spying regulations that have been on the books for 25 years. The Bush-Ashcroft administration scrapped the restrictions on domestic spying. The FBI is instructing local police officers to infiltrate peaceful protests. I get very, very queasy when federal law enforcement is effectively saying going back to the bad old days when the FBI was spying on people like Martin Luther King. They're not hunting down or looking for what most people would define as terrorism. They're spending their money, their time, the hours of the officers looking after peace groups and challenging peace groups and disrupting and surveilling peace organizations. That, that there are people in this country, millions of us, who stand with the people of the world in our face. I'm sorry? Get that out of my face. You're going to get arrested too. And in Colorado, they had police officers in their midst getting arrested with them. One of the police officers had come to one of their meetings a night before an activity and acting as an agent provocateur had tried to encourage the group to take more aggressive and violent conduct towards the police. He called himself Chris when in reality his name was Darren Christensen of the Arapahoe County Sheriff's Department. The group refused to go along with his suggestion. When the others were being led away by the police, Chris was caught on tape being greeted by fellow officers. A similar thing happened in Washington, D.C. There was an agent provocateur that came to a meeting of people planning for protests and proposed to them that they should plant bombs on bridges or, or items that look like bombs or call in bomb threats. 
And that was immediately rejected by the group of political activists who were there. But of course, people who are coming to a meeting for the first time and have, see someone in the meeting who says that, who appears to be one of the political activists, but of course is just a police officer pretending to be a political activist, that is a hugely chilling effect on people's organizing and on people wanting to come back and participate with that group. The actions of the police on the very first day that the Bush administration came to power perfectly illustrate the abuses that occur under Ashcroft's directive. People came from across the United States to protest along the parade route, engaging in peaceful protests, chanting, holding signs, opposing the incoming administration. And the Metropolitan Police Department deployed police officers, two of whom we caught on video, on an intelligence detail. On the video, what you can see is two men entering the crowd, and these are two police officers in plain clothes. One of them is wearing camouflage with a hat pulled down low. The other one is wearing a red jacket and a full face black mask covering his face except for his eyes. They stalked through a crowd of peaceful protesters along the parade route, beating and pepper spraying people. You can see the man in the red jacket shaking a can of pepper spray in his hand, which is government issued pepper spray. You can see him use the pepper spray, spraying it in close range in people's faces and eyes. You can also see him spraying it in wide berths. And this is into a crowd of peaceful protesters, people standing along the parade route, people engaging in classic First Amendment protected activity and being attacked by the police department. Stop your Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or the right of the people peaceably to assemble. The First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. This George Washington University graduate is a rowing champion. He's the first African American to win the U.S. Nationals, and he's the first to win in international competition. He travels the world competing for the United States. My name is Akil Abdullah, and uh, it's a Muslim name. My full name is Akil Hashem Abdullah. Akil means intelligent. Hashem means destroyer of evil, and Abdullah means follower of God. He considers himself a Catholic like his mother, but he was given a name that reflects his father's faith. Since 9-11, uh, travel for me has been somewhat interesting. I was stopped for the first time at the airport in Philadelphia. They call over the, the airport police. It took about two hours and 45 minutes. It somewhat disturbed me, but at the same time, I felt as though, well, maybe this is a good thing. We need to have something in place that protects people. But then it happened to me again, and I wound up missing my flight. Like most Americans, Akil was willing to accept added airport security measures. But why was it happening again and again? How could he clear his name? I want to represent my country in every way. But once you're on the plane, you feel as though people are still looking at you as a possible threat. It turned out his name had been put on a special list. This was happening all over the US in a seemingly arbitrary fashion. David Lindorf broke the no-fly story in Salon magazine. You don't get a lot of confidence that the Transportation Security Administration is, list is really doing anything to make us any safer, especially when you see some of the ridiculous things that they're doing. We have a 71-year-old nun who was simply flying with some students to lobby their congressman. Numerous people with the name David Nelson, which is obviously a very common name, were stopped at the airport and questioned in connection with being on the no-fly list. They stopped a guy who had the unfortunate name Padilla, the alleged dirty bomber. But he'd already been caught months before and was in a military brig in South Carolina. Hundreds or possibly thousands of innocent people are stopped and detained at our airports because of their name, when in fact all of that does nothing to improve security. Many of the individuals who have been stopped are people who have been critical of the Bush administration's policies. I got stopped at the screening machines and they I guess they asked me some questions and they looked at my ID and then the next thing I knew is they told me that they wanted to search me there's a little screen that's there that's like a two partition screen and they tell me to go behind the screen and I go behind the screen and you know it, it blocks your view from the people coming in this way it doesn't block your view this way well I didn't really know what they were gonna do is not only make me take off my jacket and everything else I was wearing but they made me 
pull my pants down. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, you know, I had my shoes off, my pants were down around my ankles, and, you know, there's, you know, people walking this way, and there's nothing screening me from the rest of the airport this way. So, you know, it's like a little show there. The government has now decided everyone will get a terrorism risk assessment. But who is going to sort through the data of the millions of Americans who fly? And what will be the criteria used to decide who poses a risk? Besides overloading law enforcement with useless information, these techniques reinforce the feeling that no one has a real plan for catching terrorists and that everyone is a suspect. The end result is a country of Americans ratting on each other, turning each other in, calling the police. It happened to Andrew O'Connor in Utah when a security guard overheard him say something the guard thought was dangerous in a college library. A girl sat down next to me and she had a no war button on. And I said, you know, George Bush is out of control. I would guess probably 30 minutes later. I looked over my shoulder and there were four Santa Fe police officers standing behind me. And the one, the one officer says to me, stand up, put your hands behind your back. And A.J. Brown, a student in North Carolina, found agents at her door eager to inspect the tip they had about un-American activities going on inside her apartment. They were referring to this poster. They flipped out their badges and um, they said that they were from the Raleigh Department of the Secret Service branch and whatnot, and I was like, whoa. It got to the point where ratting on each other had become institutionalized with the creation of TIPS, the ill-conceived terrorism information and prevention system. The idea was they were going to try to get people in uh, jobs like electric meter readers, telephone repairmen, UPS delivery people, people in transportation like bus drivers and taxi drivers, and then homeowners, just people to report on their neighbors, that all these people would report any suspicious activity. 20 million Americans spying on each other. That was sort of the target number they were looking for. In order to see what was going on with the TIPS program, I signed up to be a volunteer. Uh, they had an online sign-up, and I must have waited several weeks. I was anxiously hoping to get my decoder ring and my spy kit, and nothing came. So after a while, I called the Justice Department, and the woman said, well, we have set up with the FBI this 800 number for you to call. So I dialed the 800 number, and I got this perky woman's voice saying, America's Most Wanted, and I was taken aback, and I asked, well, isn't this the FBI? I thought I was calling the FBI, and she said, no, this is the Fox TV program, America's Most Wanted. Uh, we're uh, working with the Justice Department on the TIPS program. So I mean, this is sort of the ultimate in privatization, turning over this whole intelligence operation to Fox TV. The FBI denied using Fox TV, but Lindorf and Salon Magazine stand by the story. Shortly after it hit the press, the Justice Department killed the program. This kind of process, which the law enforcement people call shaking the trees, that might have been maybe minimally acceptable in a couple of weeks after September 11th. But, you know, two years later, it is not because it hasn't done anything. Another instance of shaking the trees has taken place in scuba diving shops all across the country. We got a phone call from the LAPD on behalf of the FBI, and they served us with a subpoena. The subpoena was worded in such a way that they said they wanted the names of all of our customers for the past three years. That would include people who have done scuba training. That would include people who come in and bought a book. If you came in and were interested in buying a snorkel, then I had to turn over your name to the FBI. The thought was that terrorists were going to train themselves as scuba divers, swim into ports and harbors, and blow things up. Basically, you're talking about training people like Navy SEALs, trained for years and years and years, and a lot of them can't do this. It's, it's an incredibly complex skill. And I think if anybody you know, said, this sort of makes sense, and you think there's a plot going on, you're going to be happy to cooperate. But again, this was just such a broad-based fishing expedition that it, it's a waste of their time as well as a, a terrible infringement upon you know, constitutional guarantees that have been in place for over 200 years. And so at that point, we said flat out, we will not give you any names 
from our customer database because we feel that the subpoena violated our Fourth Amendment rights to unreasonable search and seizure. So when we said to them, we want to go before a judge, they really balked. Our attorneys went back and forth a couple of times, and finally they withdrew the subpoena. Had they gone to court and lost, which I think they would have, the problem is this voluntary cooperation is suddenly going to dry up. But they would, it would set a precedent. They do not have a right to get certain information. They are not allowed to ask you, give me all your names, nor do you have to comply. Attorney General Ashcroft accused librarians of being hysteric about the Patriot Act. And um, when you understand all the libraries in the country that had been visited by FBI agents wanting information, I don't think that their response was hysteric at all. The FBI or somebody can't subpoena what we don't have. Lots of libraries across the country are shredding their records just as we are. The second thing we did was to post warning signs alerting our patrons to the fact that we were no longer going to be able to protect their constitutional right to privacy. Most people really believe that public libraries um, are sacred institutions where what they go in and read is nobody's business but their own. If this nation is to be wise as well as strong, if we are to achieve our destiny, then we need more new ideas for more wise men reading more good books in more public libraries. These libraries should be open to all, except the censor. Let us welcome controversial books and controversial authors, for the Bill of Rights is a guardian of our security as well as our liberty. John F. Kennedy. Non-compliance has become a watchword as communities across America fight back against the destruction of civil liberties. The oath of office as a city council person is to defend and uphold the Constitution against all enemies, domestic and foreign. And it's time to take back the government from an executive branch that is running berserk. Dave Nazerve sponsored a resolution making Arcata, California a civil liberties safe zone from the Patriot Act. If the police are requested by federal agents to participate in a search or an arrest procedure that they perceive to be possibly unconstitutional, then it is incumbent upon them under our ordinance to refuse to cooperate at that time and to immediately notify the council that they've been asked to do that. What we need to do is band together in states, in municipalities, and say, not in our town, you don't enforce these unconstitutional laws. Fear strikes really close to home. It is a local issue. And we've had quite a bit, quite enough of it in this community since the Patriot Act was passed. I would submit to you, the Eugene City Council, that courage is the antidote to fear. And I really urge you to have the courage to pass this resolution of the Lane County Bill of Rights Defense Committee, which opposes the portions of the Patriot Act that are against the Constitution, that are um, against our rights under the Bill of Rights. You can say to yourself, well, it's not going to affect me. I don't have any political dissident views. It's not going to affect me. I'm not an immigrant. It's not going to affect me. I'm not going to be investigated by the state or the police, it's not going to affect me. I'm not going to be a, a subject to any searches or seizures. Throughout our histories, that, that sort of philosophy has not really made America move forward. It has held America back. With that philosophy, certain people would be interned. Oh, God, certain people are about to become interned. Motion carries you now. Now, four states and more than 300 municipalities have joined the cities of Arcata and Eugene in passing resolutions against the Patriot Act. We were very amused by comments from a Justice Department spokesman who says that obviously federal law trumps local law. If the federal government would like to come and say that somehow they are going to make us withdraw our ordinance to quote our presence, I say bring them on. We've always thought of ourselves as the city on the hill, the model 
hope for democracy that we would like to disseminate throughout the world. And yet, by our actions after September 11th, uh, we have destroyed that model. The designation of enemy combatants, the hold until cleared policy, the disregard of the Geneva Convention, the infiltration of groups and First Amendment activities, all of that happened without Congress's say-so input and without a public debate about whether or not the government was going too far too fast. This is not an issue of the left and the right. This is an issue of our basic freedoms. Some of our values aren't written in paper, but have been established and grown through our, our history. And the intangible values that make America great and have the presence around the world that it does and be looked to as a leader, we need to stick to those intangible values as well. The United States really is different from other countries. We're not like France or England or Japan. We're not bound together by a common race or a common religion. What binds this country together are our principles. Most importantly, democracy, fairness, and the rule of law. The American public has to remind itself not just what it is that we're fighting against, but what are we fighting for? That these core values that define us as a country are what make us strong as a nation. They're not our weakness. By that time, no one was left.